and welcome to Stories of Scotland, a podcast about Scottish history, culture and folklore. I'm Annie, a very detailed map. And I'm Jenny, a semi-useful coordinate. And do you know what this map is for, Annie? I mean, if I'm the map, then it's all about me, right? Um, no, sorry, that is that is wrong. This is actually our stories map. Because a few weeks ago, I took all of the locations of the various stories that we've told in our over 100 episodes of Stories of Scotland and put them all onto an interactive map of the country. Now, naturally, when we finished this map, we were very proud of it. So we put it out on the internet, on all of our social media channels. And the first response that we got was from a man on Facebook asking, Why no Galloway? Why no Galloway? Why no Galloway? Those three words, Annie, haunted me in my sleep. For this man on Facebook was right. Why no Galloway? We're not Stories of Scotland minus Galloway. That's a much less catchy title. Exactly. And so, dear listener, fear not. For we are going to be spending the next season of Stories of Scotland moving all around our stories map and looking at areas and places that so far we've not really covered, beginning, of course, with a giddy gallivant to the gargantuan green graceful glens of glorious Galloway. Sounds gorgeously gleeful. Guess it does. (laughs) (laughs) There is so much to Galloway that we can only cover a little in this episode, but do not worry, man on Facebook, for we will pop back throughout our bald spot tour of the country, ensuring a thick, consistent covering of Galloway. The map that Jenny's designed is a wonderful visual aid for us to have a look at some of the areas that do need love and attention. And I am so excited that we're going to be visiting all the places that we haven't told stories about yet. I want to get this podcast to the point that we aren't just covering regions, but every city, town and village. I kind of want to go the other way, Annie. I say we just rebrand to Stories of Galloway. I don't think there's enough alliteration (laughs) for that. (laughs) Yeah, we have run through like half the G alphabet as it is so far. (laughs) But gear up, Annie, because it's time for us to gallop down to Galloway. Like the little goblins we are. (laughs) can't say that there. Why not? I mean, as far as we know, goblins might gallop. <laughs> Galloway is nestled in the southwestern corner of Scotland. It's got everything you could want from a landscape. Acres of forest, endless rocky coasts with stunning sandy beaches and rich agricultural land. I grew up on a farm and whilst I was living in the Highlands, one of my favourite farming outputs that I'd see around at the farmer shows come from Galloway, and that's the cows. The Galloway cows are a small, chunky, beautiful breed with lovely, slightly curly hair. I relate to them a lot. I especially adore the belted Galloway cows, who are particularly dashing because they have a completely black coat but then they wear a wide white band around their middles. So it gives this impression that they're wearing like one of those belts that was popular briefly in the early 2000s that people would wear to highlight their waists. It's like that, but with cows. So whenever I see belted Galloways, I always think of them as ladies on a night out and I smile. Oh, you smile. I cringe because the Galloway cows may be able to pull off that look at it, but I couldn't believe me. I don't... (laughs) I don't know how we ever thought that looked good. I would wear big, thick belts over, like, hoodies. I don't I don't want to talk about it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Just in my Galloway cow era, guys. Don't worry about me. <laughs> <laughs> One of these lovely cows in the Galloway era might explain to you that the place name of Galloway comes from the Gallic meaning Stranger Gale or Foreign Gale. There's a couple of different theories about where this name came from but they almost all point towards a story of migration of people. So it could be a name given to Galloway by the Irish Gales, that the people of Galloway were foreign to them. Galloway would have been a key connecting point for Ireland and Scotland because the coast is on the Irish Sea. 
Or it could be that the Gales of Galloway were ruled for a period by someone who was from elsewhere in Europe. And then a very popular idea is that the early Gaelic speakers of Galloway were referencing their own Norse connections. That they were from a Norse people who had settled in Galloway and now took the language of the Gaels. Either way, the name is saying that this land belongs to a mixture of cultures. Well, Annie, let's be strangers to Galloway no more. What better way to start our exploration of Galloway than by taking a lovely hike up the tallest hill in the area, the Merrick. The Merrick is a bit of a funny name for a hill, but it comes from Gaelic and means the finger, which also seems like a bit of a funny name for a hill, but it's called this because it's the middle peak in a range of hills called the Range of the Awful Hand, which, again, seems like a bit of a funny name for a group of hills, but when viewed from afar, they are said to look like a hand. Why this hand is so awful, I do not know. But... The Merrick is the middle finger of the hand and the tallest peak, so I don't know, maybe Mother Nature is trying to tell us something. Jenny, don't be so awful. (laughs) Hey, take it up with the Merrick, Annie. (laughs) (laughs) Now, the Merrick stands at 843 metres high, or as we prefer to measure mountains in feet, it's 2,765 feet. This means that the Merrick is just below the 3,000 foot height required to be classified as a Munro, and thus it is classed as a Corbett. And Corbetts are hills which sit between 2,500 and 3,000 feet in height. But don't let this fool you into thinking that the Merrick is a small hill. It is the tallest peak in the southern uplands. And from up there, the views are astounding. You can see for miles around, and then some more miles, and then just in case, just a a few extra miles. Because from the very tippy-toppy of the Merrick, it is possible to see 144 miles south to the peak of Snowdon, which is Wales' tallest mountain. This is the longest line of sight in the British Isles, And while confirmed sightings of this are rare, when the conditions are just right, they can happen. Ah, I love this. It's so cool. If you are at the top of the Merrick, when you're not straining into the distance, you can take in the surrounding Galloway landscape. To the north and east, the hills of the southern uplands roll into the distance, and to the south and west... The land stretches out from undulating heather-clad hills to a patchwork of agricultural land and dense forest. But below the forests and heather and soil, the rock of this area tells an extraordinary story. You aren't about to turn me into a grain of sand again, Jenny. Ah, I wish, no. But listeners, for a really detailed explanation of the geology of this landscape through the eyes of a grain of sand you can listen to our Merlin of the Tweed episode. But what I will say about the geology of this land is that the majority of Galloway has a bedrock of sedimentary rocks that formed around 450 million years ago as layers of sand were compressed at the bottom of a long-gone ocean. Over the millennia, volcanic activity occurred as tectonic plates collided and huge pockets of hot liquid magma were injected into the sedimentary rocks and these cooled to form large areas of igneous granite. The heat of these granite intrusions baked and hardened the nearby sedimentary rock, turning it into greywack. And it's this greywack that makes up the Merrick. I'm so relieved I'm not being turned to sand again. I have no journey of the sand for you, but what I do have is the journey of a boulder. Oh, turnips. Turnips indeed, Annie. Because although the Merrick is made of greywack, not far from its peak lie some huge granite boulders. And these granite boulders help us unravel the story of the distant past. Because how did these igneous rocks end up on the very top of a sedimentary mountain, Annie? Where did they come from? Why are they here? 
I have this gut feeling that you're going to turn me into a boulder so that we can all find out together. Correct. Yay. (laughs) Welcome to the world, Boulder Annie. It's 400 million years before Common Era and you are scorching hot off the colliding continent's press. How do you feel? Honestly, I'm quite upset to be a rock again. I thought I'd done my geologic time, but as I'm learning, (laughs) geologic time is incredibly long and difficult to comprehend. So I guess I'm just going to take it for the team. I'm going to cool off for a little while and wait. And while you do that, you're also slowly baking the sandstone next to you into Greywack. How's that for multitasking? (laughs) I'm a talented boulder. You know, if you're going to boulder, do it right. (laughs) Now, over the next few hundred million years, you are doing a lot of cooling down, deep underground, whilst also moving around the globe, riding the tectonic plates wherever they slowly sweep you. And eventually... You end up high in the Northern Hemisphere, on the edge of a continent, during an ice age. Welcome to Scotland. This is not the warm welcome I was expecting. An ice age? You've got to be joking me. I was wanting Boulder of the Year Award and a nice little trip to the Caribbean. Yeah, no, sorry, not at all. Because around 33,000 years ago, so this is actually relatively recent in geologic time, the late Davincian glaciation began. By now, you've been thrust up near the surface, but any hope of a breath of fresh air is dashed by a truly gargantuan ice sheet forming atop you. But worry not, Annie, because actually, this is a great time for you. It's when you get to break free from the shackles of your granite pluton and start exploring the outside world. What's a pluton? A pluton is the name we give to a huge mass of granite. The cairngorms are part of a pluton, technically. So basically, injected magma underground that has cooled over millennia to form rock. And I'm leaving my pluton behind? I'm going independent? You are. Capital I, independent. Am I going to be like Jerry and the Spice Girls? Is that what I'm doing? Am I going to have a great life? Tell me more. Tell me more. Think posh spice, Annie. Here we go. (laughs) Glaciers are not static things. They are pulled towards sea level by gravity, whilst also being pushed by masses of new ice forming behind them. They're essentially rivers of slow-flowing ice. And as they slowly slide towards the sea, their undersides freeze around any protruding bedrock below. As they move, they rip up this rock and drag it along. These suspended boulders act like sandpaper, scraping away at the rock below, loosening it up too so it can be plucked up by the glacier as well. This abrasive action makes glaciers and ice sheets powerful erosional forces. And what do you know, Annie? It's your turn to be plucked. Now I'm kind of nervous about going out there on my own. You don't have a choice. (laughs) (laughs) Depending on the glacier or ice sheet, Boulders can be transported tens to hundreds of miles. In your case, you've been picked up by a huge ice sheet that covers the entire landscape and stretches down into England. And whilst you're in the ice, you travel a modest 10 miles. But around 12,000 years ago, your ice sheet slowly starts to melt and your frozen journey ends. As the ice sheet retreats, all the sediments and boulders that it's carrying are deposited onto the newly exposed ground below. And you, Boulder Annie, are dropped onto your new home. But what's amazing about you is just quite how high you end up. You are over 200 metres higher than any other granite in the area. Somehow, in a way that even today geologists are not quite sure about, your ice sheet tore you up from far below carried you up this mountain and then plopped you down on what would soon become the peak of the Merrick. You are now officially an erratic. A boulder that has been carried far from its bedrock beginnings and deposited in a completely new area. And what a lucky erratic you are, because the views are fabulous and you get to be in a podcast. 
How wonderful. You know, I really enjoy being a little bit erratic. And also, I'm like the stranger rock to the stranger gales, which I think is quite awesome. You are, you are. And I'm glad you've enjoyed your rocky past because we can all learn so much from you. These erratic boulders atop the Merrick help to tell the complex prehistoric story of Galloway. Erratics tell us which direction the ice sheet was travelling, how large and deep it was, the type of ice and speed of ice flow that was occurring, and even when the ice sheet receded and the pace at which it did. All of this information helps us to reconstruct the story of the landscape. For while the ice has long melted, the erratics remain as strange signposts to the distant past. So actually, by looking at this rock that at first seems like it doesn't belong within the landscape, it can actually tell us so much more about the story of what's happened there. Yeah, exactly. But before we move on, there is just one last rock feature that I want to talk about, and it's called the Grey Man of the Merrick. Because on the side of the Merrick, there is a rocky outcrop. So rather than a loose boulder, this is part of the bedrock that sticks out from surrounding vegetation. And when this particular outcrop is viewed from the side, it is the clearest memetolith I know of in all of Scotland. And what would a memetolith be? A memetolith is a natural rock formation which we humans think resembles something other than just rock. In the case of the Grey Man of the Merrick, as the name suggests, it resembles the profile of a bearded man's face. Okay, so this is a great example of apophenia. The tendency that we humans have to perceive meaningful patterns in random things, like the shapes of clouds or seeing a big face in the rocks. Yes, exactly. And this huge grey whack face overlooks the southern uplands, like our guardian of the glens. He is truly spectacular, but if you do decide to go and see him, make sure you bring a map and compass because he is not on any path, so you will have to do a little bit of good old navigation to get to him. Well, Jenny, it's not just the landscape that is spectacular. Let's jump from the peak of the Merrick down to the water's edge. We're going to the east of Wigtown Bay, where I have some phenomenal Neolithic buildings to blether about. We're going to go and see some gallery graves. An art gallery? (gasps) Are there skulls on show? Gallery just means it's a long rectangular room. Though galleries are popular places for art, We definitely don't have any Neolithic paintings hanging inside these gallery graves. These cairns were constructed around 5,000 years ago by the Neolithic people of Galloway. They were used to bury and hold human remains, most likely those of important figures in the Stone Age society. Let's examine the two sites of Cairn Holy. These cairns are set in a stunning landscape, They're atop a hill, and so they have views across to the Irish Sea. If I show you a picture of them, can you describe what you're seeing? All right. Oh, yeah, this is not what I was expecting at all, actually. Uh, To be honest, this site looks more like a standing stone circle than cairns at first glance, because there are these tall, thin stones standing erect, rather than what I usually think of as a burial cairn, which would be like a large, round-ish pile of much smaller stones. But these cairns are megalithic structures. They are made of massive stones. The tallest is around maybe two metres high, maybe a little more. One of the cairns is definitely more complete than the other, although they both do look like they have been disturbed by people and weather over the millennia, as you would expect. The two sites are rather unimaginatively named... Cairn Holy 1 and Cairn Holy 2. <laughs> okay, so Cairn Holy 1 is the more complete one. You can see the remnants of what I'm guessing was the Cairn part, so you have the actual chamber bit of it. 
Then, curiously, there's these eight standing stones in a curved line at the top of the chamber, as though shielding it from something beyond. And then between each standing stone, there's a low wall, which looks just like a dry stone dike, the dry stone walls you see in fields all across Scotland. Archaeologists have a theory about this curving facade of tall standing stones. They think it formed the back wall of a forecourt in the front of the tomb. Although the stones stand jagged and proud now, this was not how the cairn would have looked upon its construction. Many stones would have been piled up to cover the whole burial chamber, but these have been removed over the millennia to build other structures, like those wonderful dry stone dikes that you've just mentioned, Jenny. When the cairn was in use, it would have been a long, straight-sided mound, measuring about 43 metres by 10 metres, which is a really big thing to build out of stones. Wow, okay, so it was much bigger than it currently looks. So what we're seeing is the skeleton of the structure, essentially. There is an amazing opening between the middle two tallest standing stones. It's like a big gap in giant front teeth, or the space between horns. That's the entrance to a narrow antechamber. If you pass through it, it leads to the rectangular room that we've mentioned. These types of megalithic structures are categorised as Clyde Cairns. Their characteristics are that they have a chamber for the dead body to be placed in, and then a brilliant big flat stone laying on top of this. The entrance could then be sealed with another stone to protect the body from being disturbed by wild animals or anything really. However, if I show you this whole structure from an aerial view, you can tell us about it because it's, it's a very different story when you see it from above. What a different perspective. From above, the whole structure looks like a bird in flight. The antechamber and chamber form the body of the bird and then the curved standing stone walls forms like big widespread wings that look like they're in mid-flap. I wonder if this was intentional at all. If the Neolithic people who built this cairn, a place for their dad, designed it to look so bird-like. Perhaps a symbol for the spirit. I don't know. Probably not. I mean, it's possible, Annie. Burial cairns were built to protect the body within, but to also be a spectacle, and we have to assume on some level to protect the spirit of the person that was in there. We don't know exactly what these Neolithic folk believed or the rites of death that were performed in this place, but it does offer a fascinating glimpse into Neolithic cycles of life. It's quite possible that they used it in the same way that we use modern graves, you know, to remember and honour their dead. It's an impressive way to show that your ancestors have held power in an area, that the place belongs to your kin. A lot of the archaeological examinations of the Holy Cairn sites give us an excellent picture of the lives of the Neolithic people who built them. To begin with, there's evidence of hearths, so we know that they were burning things in the forecourt of the first Cairn Holy. Amongst this, it would have been used for performing funeral rituals, such as cremation. But what was dug up from this site is amazing. Let's have a look at these treasures robbed from the grave sites of these ancient peoples. And there you were, Annie, saying this was not a gallery sort of gallery because I like to put all these items in one place and call it the Gallery Grave Gallery. Of gorgeous Galloway. <laughs> so let me show you the collection. Let's start with these cremated human remains, an essential item from any chamber tomb. And again, this helps us to establish that this site was in fact tied to death and remembrance for the people who used it. That's exactly what we were expecting. Yep, alright, okay, fine. I'll step up the wow factor on, like, ancient ashes. <laughs> <laughs> then, over here in the corner, we have some stunning rock art. One of the more powerful pieces showcases six carved concentric circles rippling out from a central point. It looks very much like a dartboard or a target practice, but made of rock. 
Or I like to think of it as a soul with the layers of human on top of it. A representation of the person through circles. That's just because you love Shrek. And if you look at it, it's like an onion with layers, isn't it, Jenny? Yeah, exactly. That is what I was going for. Yep. <laughs> well, that sounds like a particularly practical and meaningful item. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's functionality you're looking for, Annie, then there's plenty of pottery and arrowheads that were found in and around the Cairn Holy area. Some of the pottery is dated from much later than the original construction of the Cairn, which shows that the buildings were in use for a very long time by many, many, many different generations of people. I would visit this gallery. Thank you. We put a lot of time into the visitor experience. You can fill out a feedback form (laughs) on your way out. (laughs) A lot of people think that the most striking artefact is this axe fragment made of grey-green jadeite. Not only is this a beautiful piece of rock, it's also from the Alps, so it's incredibly well-travelled. This item ties the cairns to a broader European Neolithic society and shows connections from the jade mines of the Italian Alps to glorious Galloway. The makers of these axe heads would have spent days upon days polishing them. Then they would have been transported through France and then by sea to Britain, and somehow they travelled all the way up through Britain and were either given as a gift to someone, were sold, possibly won in battle. Often beautiful items like this are more ceremonial than practical, so it would have been a sort of status symbol to have this beautiful green axe from Italy. But yeah, it just shows how wonderfully well-connected these Neolithic folk were to the wider world around them. Can you imagine being the one person in your Neolithic village with a shockingly strong green axe? What a treasured possession that really shows your position in that society. Oh yeah, you do not want to mess with Big Jim with the green axe. (laughs) (laughs) But interestingly, only a fragment of this axe was found in the Cairnholy site. So it's believed that it may even have been deliberately broken before being buried, perhaps as a method of sort of ceremoniously killing the axe or, you know, the owner has died, therefore the axe must die as well. Or perhaps someone wanted the precious axe to join an ancestor in the afterlife. Or maybe even it broke during use and they weren't quite sure what to do with half of it and decided to give this beautiful rock to their ancestors' spirits, you know? There's so many different stories that could be tied to it. What better artefact could ever be found here? (laughs) A stone. A stone. A pitch stone. But not just any pitch stone, Annie. A piece of blue-grey volcanic glass from the Isle of Arryn. It was found beneath the portal stone, so the stone that would be protecting the body from the outside world. So perhaps this wonderful rock was thought to have protective qualities. To place it here was to mean that no bad spirits could get through or no wild animals could eat your uncle. It's a bit like putting a horseshoe on your door or anything on your door that's there for luck, really. But couldn't it have been left there naturally, like an erratic or something? Um, no, not this one. (laughs) (laughs) This definitely came from across the sea and was definitely carried by a person, but it was definitely not an accident. Both the beautiful pitchstone and the jade axe fragment shows us how international and connected the Neolithic people were. The stories of these stones are stories of movements and meetings across territories with fluid borders. Either that or you just had some Neolithic person who loved shiny stones and in the same way that I have a rock collection, they too had a rock collection and just as I am going to insist on being buried with mine, they insisted on being buried with theirs. Genuinely, whenever I get in your car, Jenny, and I I sit down without checking and I'm like, ah, it's a bump, what is it? And you've got like your favourite rock just sitting there and then I go in the glove compartment looking for sweeties and it's just full of rocks. (laughs) I probably waste loads of petrol to carting all my rocks around. (laughs) (laughs) Oh dear Jenny. But I do think your gallery grave gallery is a winner Jenny. 
Those are all some pretty amazing tangible artifacts. However, in Cairn Holy 2, we have something a little less tangible. Because it's said to be the tomb of the Scottish King Galdus. I mean, that's only more impressive than my gallery grave if he's also made of pitch stone from iron. All the information we have on King Galdus comes from the history books of Hector Boys, a Scottish historian from the 15th to 16th centuries, and while he doesn't mention that the king was made of pitch stone, Boyce does tell a somewhat curious story of Scotland in the start of the first millennium common era. So let's introduce ourselves to the mysterious King Galdus as a prince. After his death, King Corbreed left behind him three sons. They were so young that none of them could secede to the crown. Their names were Corbreed, Tolkien and Brekus. The first of them was brought up in Britain by his aunt Boudicca, the valiant queen of the Britons. He was called Corbredus Galdus, for among us, all people that are composed and honest are called Galdus. Well, Annie, you can just call me Galdus from now on. (laughs) Oh, Jenny, you wouldn't be the first to try to steal his name. (laughs) But actually, they are naming him Galdus in the same way that Gal means stranger or foreigner, because he's been brought up outside of Scotland with his auntie Boudicca. This is one of the most notable features in this story about our to-be King Galdus, because he's the nephew of Boudicca. She is the warrior queen who led an uprising against the Roman Empire in Britain. I love that the ancient version of being a cool aunt is to take lead of a 30,000 strong tribal army for independence against the Romans. I've got a nephew, and I'll be honest, Annie, I don't know if I can live up to these standards. It's a lot. (laughs) There's still time to hone your ancient warfare skills, Jenny. Maybe I'll just be uncool, Aunt Jenny. Honestly, it's fine. (laughs) (laughs) You could never be uncool, Jenny. Not with all those stones in your car. (laughs) However, (laughs) it's fortunate that young King Galdus was nurtured in the arts of war. As Forrest explains to us that his childhood becomes pretty turbulent pretty fast. Galdus is too young when his father dies to take his crown. And in these times, there always had to be a king. So instead, the nobles selected a man named Darden to rule in stead of Galdus. Darden began as a very well-liked king. But after a couple of years, he became highly corrupt falling to many vices. He only favoured nobles who spent their time flattering him and boosting up his ego. I mean, that's understandable, right? A little bit of nepotism is a key trait of any royalty, so I think I'm going to let it slide this time, Annie. I kind of like this Darden fellow. But then Darden was also easily bribed, and anyone who wasn't trying to bribe him and wasn't lining his pockets with gold suddenly find themselves being threatened with massive punishments. Right, well that is workplace misconduct, so he will get a written warning for that. And then, fearful of a challenge to his throne, Darden started evilly plotting to have Galdus and his two little brothers killed. Right, yeah, that that one is a sackable offence. Aye, so as Boris puts it, both the commons and the nobles rebelled, and they called Darden out, as a traitorous turnip for conspiring to slay the dead king's children. That's it. I've had it, Annie. Let's call security on him. You don't start being traitorous root vegetables up in this royal court. Yes. Darden was labelled as a cruel tyrant, and so they did as you do back then, and they beheaded him. The people celebrated, and then they crowned Galdus as the king. Though his childhood had some highs and lows... Roman warfare with his auntie, then casual murderous plots. Bors describes Galdus as an incredible king. He clearly dealt with his childhood issues and moved on to be a good leader. Bors writes, Both a righteous heir to the throne and a most excellent person. Galdus, after his coronation, 
made sacrifice to the gods for the joy falling upon him. He was of noble and ancient blood. His mother was the king of the Pict's daughter. Yeah, he sounds pretty great, Annie. I like him. But then again, I like Darden as well at the beginning, so who knows what's about to happen. <laughs> My judgment in ancient leaders isn't great. <laughs> Galdus really makes his name, though, as a king in the times of war. Do you know the story? Oh, you bet I do. Because although his aunt, Boudicca, had been fighting the Romans as best she could, she was unsuccessful in holding back their conquering of Britain. And by 83 Common Era, the Romans were rapidly advancing through what we now know as the Scottish Lowlands and the Central Belt. The people of Caledonia, of whom Galdus was now the king, were the last great tribe to remain undefeated on the British Isles and the Romans were desperate to put an end to their resistance. The Romans eventually decided that the best way to draw them out into full battle, rather than their preferred guerrilla warfare, was to attack their grain reserves right after the harvest. Now Galdus, being a good king, didn't want his people to starve through the winter, and so he reluctantly gathered a huge force of 30,000 warriors then, they met the Roman army of equal size at the foothills of the Grampian Mountains, which is basically the northern edge of the central belt. Here, a brutal and bloody battle commenced, but Galdus's forces were no match for the superior Roman army, and they suffered huge losses of up to 10,000 men. The remaining 20,000 men fled into the forests, mountains and glens of the north, but the Romans had won. Agricola, the leader of the Romans in Britain, wrote to the Roman emperor boasting of his victory. But despite this, he was soon removed from his position in the British Isles and relocated within the empire. And unfortunately for him, he was then poisoned. But this was fortunate for Galdus, because the replacement Roman leader in Britain was nowhere near as organised or aggressive when it came to conquering and controlling the people of Caledonia. King Galdus watched as this lack of leadership meant the Roman forces in the area began crumbling, and he decided it was high time for a counter-offensive. And so he rallied all his troops who had scattered far and wide, and with his reconvened army began marching south, fighting and beating every Roman regiment they encountered. This powerful Caledonian army was unstoppable, and they steamrolled through the country, reclaiming castles, destroying Roman structures, and freeing the people held under Roman rule. In no time at all, they had pushed the Roman forces all the way back down to Novante, and cornered them against the Irish Sea and the Solway Firth. Here, the bloodiest and most brutal battles took place, but Galdus was there commanding his troops to victory in every one. Oh, what a warrior king he was! When the final Romans were defeated in Novante and their forces finally vanquished in Caledonia, Galdus was celebrated as the finest leader the land had ever known. In his campaign, he had united the entirety of what we now call Scotland and secured its status as a strong, independent nation who don't need no absent landlord emperor. He reigned over his country for 35 years and ensured that peace, law and love were spread throughout his lands. He eventually died in the mid-2nd century, and because he had claimed his last major victory against the Romans in Novante, he was buried there in a grand tomb, which was constructed of great stones, the largest of which was carved in his likeness and inscribed with the story of how he had freed his country from the Roman invasion. Obelisks were erected around his tomb, which of course is Cairnholy too. But not only this, the whole region was named after him as Galdia, which over the years has turned into Galloway. Well, Jenny, 
that <laughs> is a very imaginative story. But unfortunately, it's all rotten turnips. Hey! <laughs> oh, come on, Jenny. First off, we know the cairns were built in the fourth millennium before Common Era, which means that they are around five to 6,000 years old. They are long before the Roman invasion of Britain, which was in the early first century Common Era. So logically... The Neolithic people weren't building a grave for Iron Age people who were to come to the land a few thousand years afterwards. I don't like your attitude, Annie. They could have read it in the stars, okay? (laughs) But I do have to admit you have a small 4,000-year-old point there. But beyond this, it's the first mention of a Roman fighting king by the name of Galdus. And it comes along in 1527 by Hector Boris, which is significantly after this so-called king existed. Boris tells a different version of this history, but it's similar to what you've given us. And a lot of writers had regurgitated what Boris had written, and so it's quite a common myth. However, it doesn't match up to any of the Roman records, and the Romans were actually excellent archivists. I think part of maintaining an empire is maintaining really good documentation about your own history and then destroying the history of the people that you're colonizing. Historians believe that Bose took inspiration from the real chieftain Calgacus, who was a historical figure mentioned in the Roman records. A very interesting Roman historian, Tacitus, wrote about the Battle of Mons Gropius between the soldiers of the Roman Empire and a mixed group of Caledonian tribes. Mons Gropius is the large battle that you were referencing in that story that would have been up near the Grampian Mountains. We're not quite sure where, though what we do know is it's quite far away from Galloway. He attributes a speech from one of the leaders of these tribes standing against the might of the Roman Empire. And it's one of my favourite speeches. It's amazingly powerful. And I think I quoted it about a hundred episodes ago. But I'm just going to do this. I'm going to find an excuse to bring this speech out. You honestly quote this at me like three times a week. (laughs) (laughs) Every time I sit on a stone in your car... (laughs) I'm like, hey, Jenny, <laughs> you know what Calgacus said at the Battle of Mons Gropius? The Romans rob, slaughter, and plunder, and they give it the lying name of empire. They make a desert, and they call it peace. According to Tacticus, the Caledonians lost at the Battle of Mons Gropius. However, the Romans built the Antonine Wall a couple of generations afterwards because the Caledonians still would not be subdued by them. They wouldn't come into the fold of empire. Do you know what else is not subdued, Annie? My belief in Galdus. Because why do people say that he's buried in this cairn if he's not? Okay, so Boris writes that King Galdus was buried in the Galloway area in a grand tomb with obelisks and megaliths. Mm -hmm. In the 19th century, people read this account and did some amateur sleuthing. They put on their Sherlock hats, they got out their magnifying glasses, and they determined that the only place this could have been was either Cairnholy 2 or another megalith site in Galloway. Aw, oh, man. Fair enough. I guess back then they couldn't tell if something was 6,000 years old or 2,000 years old. It was all just old. My favourite thing is when I see standing stones nowadays and I'm like, ah, is this a Neolithic site or is it just Jenny's car? (laughs) I think it's really cool that we can trace the layering and formation of this myth, even if it just means that we have to debunk it. There is a last curiosity about these graves that I am absolutely intrigued by and I would love more information on it so if there is an archaeologist listening please write in if you know more about this mystery that I'm about to tell us about 
Oh, a problem needs solved, Annie. It's time to ask the audience. I feel like we're on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. So, dear listener, you're the other person at the end of the line on this million pound question. The people who manage the Cairn Holy Sites, Historic Environment Scotland, write statements of significance about the places that they have custodianship of. And there's a detail in this document that I can't find any more information about. And it's been stuck in my mind ever since I read it. It's a small detail in a category about the spiritual significance of Cairn Holy. So, for example, if I look at the same category in the statement on the Clavicairns near where we live up in the Highlands, it talks about the spiritual significance to people visiting during the equinox or the solstice, as well as the cultural aspect of the site. And this is what you would expect to see. However, under the spiritual header in Cairn Holy, we get... In the absence of survey data... It is not known whether the Cairn Holy Chambered Cairns currently play a spiritual role. Though the discovery of a modern cremation in the burial chamber of Cairn Holy 2 in 2003 clearly shows that someone has a close spiritual affinity with the place. And I'm just wondering, how modern is the cremation that was discovered in 2003? Was it... A hundred years ago, or was it in the early 2000s? Why do you want to know? Why not just let it be a mystery? I find it fascinating (laughs) that within our lifetimes, there could have been a cremation in a Neolithic cairn. It might explain why the 2000s as a millennium started off so rocky. Some (laughs) kind of curse was unleashed. And by cremation, do they mean that someone actually burnt a body within the cairn? Or did someone just pop a funeral urn in it with some ashes, you know? Yeah. It certainly makes more sense that someone just scattered human ashes in the cairn. But then how did they discover that? It must have been in some kind of vessel for them to see that new ashes had suddenly appeared. I've become so obsessed with the idea that in the modern era, a human body was burnt inside a cairn that I'm considering writing a murder mystery about a body being discovered burnt in a cairn. Annie, I haven't seen you so animated in a long time. Is this your way of telling me that you want to be burned in cairns upon your death? Because I'll do it. (laughs) I'll get the council paperwork. (laughs) Yes, but not soon. You know, in 60 years, when I reach a ripe age and die of natural causes, just burn my body in a cairn. But if anyone does know what cremation remains were found in 2003, please tell me, because it's going to bother me for the rest of my life until I myself am cremation remains inside a cairn. I really want to know the answer to this mystery. Yeah, whose granny was in Cairn Holy too? That's what we want to know. (laughs) Next season of Stories of Scotland, True Detective. Who burned my granny? (laughs) Who burned my granny? (laughs) (laughs) Well, on that crematory note, I am so glad that we've opened the gates to Galloway. I've really enjoyed looking at the very early history of the area, but there is so much more for us to explore, and I think we'll be visiting here much more often. No more, why no Galloway? Thank Galdus, Addy, honestly. Oh, my nightmares can finally <laughs> cease. <laughs> the two Cairn Holy sites tell us a great deal about the Neolithic people of Scotland. I find it so cool that we see regional cairn differences between different parts of the country and how different these cairns are from the ones up in the highlands where we are. Because when we first saw the Cairn Holy sites, they just look so different to the Highland ones. Yet they come from the same place of wanting to creatively express ourselves through stone and ritual. I think that's really fascinating. And whose granny was in Cairn Holy too? (laughs) (laughs) When I look at the Cairn Holy sites, I think it's a bit like when you see a church of a religion that you don't really understand, that you don't really know a lot about. You might share some of the beliefs of those people, 
or maybe not. But either way, you can look at the architectural wonder of it and appreciate that it's the way that they've expressed their spirituality and it feels impossible not to be connected to that somehow. Just this experience of being human. I love that. All right. Well, thank you all so much for listening to our wee show. If you're traveling in Scotland or you just want to learn more about a particular area, then you can head over to our website where you can use our interactive stories map to move around the country and explore the many stories of Scotland. If you've been enjoying our show and would like to help support us, then you can give us a little five star rating and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. You folk have been absolutely fantastic with reviews recently and it's bringing us so much joy. So thank you so, so much. If you want to go a step further, you can also support us on Patreon, where for the price of a kilo of turnips a month, you can gain access to lots more weird and wonderful Scottish content. A very warm welcome to our newest patrons on Patreon. Mary Lou, Linda, Cameron and John. Welcome. I like to think of you all as erratic rocks. When I was a child, I became very interested in the transmission of sound and how old gramophones were built. And one of the ways that they function is with a tiny crystal inside that resonates the sound that comes from the pick at the end. It travels all the way up through the gramophone into this crystal which resonates the sound and comes out through the horn. And ever since then, whenever I've seen rocks or crystals, I always imagine sound resonating from within them. So when Jenny tells me about erratic rocks, I imagine them resonating their little stories to one another across their travels all over the globe. And I, I love that thought of rocks talking to each other. Though maybe, maybe we could be like kind of semi-living rocks, like little giants that come alive sometimes so that we can gather and not just resonate sound from afar but maybe get our lovely mountain gramophone and turn that on and spin some discs and listen to some rock and roll (laughs) all right rock and roll i like what you did (laughs) (laughs) all right until next time slanjava slanjava Then, curiously, there's these eight standing stoves in a curved line at the top so of the chamber. So you said stove instead of stone. <laughs> standing stoves. <laughs> they're, just, they're just making pancakes. <laughs> Can we just, quick aside, were you also taught when you were younger that she was called Bodicea? And then they, like, scrapped it and called her Boudicca? Is there, like, a huge debate in the historical world? Because all my life I've called her Bodicea, and I am aware that it's not right. <laughs> Like, I don't know why. I'm not sure on that one. I call her Boudicca because of the horrible history song. Because although his aunt, Boudicca, had been fighting the Romans as best she could... I'm sorry, did you just say Boudicca? Is it not Boudicca? You you mixed Bodicea and Boudicca. <laughs> <laughs> I, I portmanteaued the two together. <laughs>